Well, he was a man who had it all. Blessed with a brilliant brain, he was a King's Scholar at Eton, got a double first at Cambridge, he was a Kennedy Scholar at Harvard, and then he added a PhD to his name. His first taste of the limelight was way back in 1995 when he was a member of the team that won the BBC quiz show University Challenge. After a stint in the city, he landed one of the safest seats in the country, becoming a Conservative MP in 2010. He then worked his way up to the second most powerful political position in the country as Britain's first black chancellor. Kwasi Kwarteng is one of those annoying people that are good at almost everything, except perhaps looking after our cash, because within 38 days of his appointment to the Treasury, it was all over. His first budget had blown up and his close friend and political ally Liz Truss had thrown him to the wolves in a vain attempt to save her own skin. And in the ultimate humiliation, he actually learned he was about to be fired when he read it on Twitter. Well, reeling from one of the most shocking political betrayals in modern history, and amid accusations he'd crashed the economy, Quasi, quite understandably, went to ground. Now he's finally ready to talk live about how his career went up in smoke, along with his vision for the UK economy. Well, the former Chancellor Kwasi Kwarteng joins us now. Hello. Thanks for being with us. Very you happy blew that pretty badly, didn't you, Kwasi? Well, it was a turbulent time. I mean, we can laugh about it, but we were trying to do a serious thing. We tried to reduce <clears throat> uh, the tax uh, burden on this country. And uh, we were caught in a, in, a, in a real firestorm. And I think um, it's a shame what happened. Uh, I do regret some of the things that we did in terms of the speed. But I think the general direction in terms of lowering tax was right. Well, look, before we get on to all that, I, I want to just step back a minute. I mean, this is your first uh, live interview since you left office. Sure. You're, you're kind of off the leash, aren't you? I mean, previously, you've always had to watch what you say because you were in Cabinet for a very long time. Well, quite a long time. I mean, I was, in, I was a minister or a PPS of the Chancellor, which is, you know, very... Uh, it's technically a, a backbencher, but you're yeah. kind of on the... But you on still have to watch what you yeah, say. Yeah, you're part of what they call the payroll. So I hope you're not going to hold back. Um, well, I'm, I'm going to speak uh, as, as freely as I, I can. But, but what I would say is that I was in those jobs as a PPS, whatever, for about seven years. Yes. Um, and now this is the first time, really, since 2015, I think, probably 2014, that I've had a live interview as, as a backbencher. Well, look, um, before we move on to all things economic, which I know Rich is absolutely itching to sure. get into, let's talk for a minute about Nicola Sturgeon. Yeah. Um, you know, this is the big story of the week. Absolutely. Um, what do you make of her sudden resignation? I think it's been fascinating. Uh, I mean, I just found out about it uh, again on Twitter. Um, and it was very sudden. I mean, she said, oh, she'd been thinking about it a lot. But really, the straw that broke the camel's back, as you'll remember, was the, uh, I think he was called Adam Graham mm. when he was a man. And then he had surgery and, and was called Isla Bryson. Mm -hmm. And this man had been convicted of rape twice and then was put into a, a woman's uh, a prison, which defies all common sense. And I think Nicola trying to, to say that this was the right thing to do, and she got herself into lots of knots, was really the straw that broke the camel's back. Her, her, her ratings uh, plunged. And essentially, her woke agenda ended up blowing up in her face. I mean, she got herself into a hell of a muddle, as you say. Um, I don't know whether you remember the clip of her getting into a real no. twist over the definition of a woman and, you know, uh, whether a trans woman is a woman. What is a woman as far as you're concerned? Well, a woman is somebody like my mother who, gave, who gives birth uh, or can, has, has the uh, capacity to give birth uh, to children. Uh, the question that she got into a pickle over is, are trans women women? Well, that was that was a great... I mean, I don't think biologically they are. I think you can call them what you will, but biologically they clearly aren't. It's, they extraordinary, are clearly aren't it's extraordinary how so many senior politicians are getting in such a pickle. I mean, it's, it's pretty <laughs> obvious. It's pretty basic stuff, isn't it, it? It is, but I think the woke agenda has just taken over. And for Nicola... I mean, she's a very able politician. I mean, to her credit, she's lasted eight years, which is a lot longer than certainly I was Chancellor. <laughs> but, 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 but actually, she got herself into a terrible pickle on uh, these quite basic issues. And I think the woke agenda essentially just... just I mean, took her but off the course. truth is, you talk about the woke agenda as if it exists, sort of, has a life of its own, but the truth is that the woke agenda is pretty rife throughout all our institutions now. I mean, take the NHS, for example. Um, do you think your own party may possibly have been a bit too timid on, on these issues? No, I think if you speak to people like uh, Kemi Badnock or Michael Gove, 
uh, they, they've been pretty clear about, about, you know, fundamentals on this. And I think it's very easy for people, politicians, to get completely muddled and defy common sense. And I think if you speak to people like Kemi Badenoch, others in the Conservative Party, there is very much a common sense approach uh, to a lot of these questions. OK. Um, just let's move on, because there's been a, recently some mm. pretty awful, apparently racially aggravated mm. uh, attacks, including one, um, I believe, alleged in your own constituency. Yeah. Um, that's obviously going to fuel claims that Britain is a racist society. What's your take on that? So my view broadly is that Britain... I mean, you look at any country in the world, Britain is a pretty tolerant place. I mean, you look at, you know, the fact the Prime Minister is from an ethnic background. Uh, I was in cabinets with lots of colleagues who are from uh, ethnic backgrounds. That's, that's a huge deal. Um, that doesn't mean that there is no racism in Britain. I mean, that's... Uh, have you ever, bold. do you feel that you've ever, in, yeah, in your mean, whole life, have you ever yeah, encountered I, look, it? I can tell you, growing up in the 80s in London was, was much more uh, racially aggravated, much, there was much more tension uh, than there is today. I mean, you'd regularly get abuse on the tube, right. um, frequently. Um, there was open uh, hostility to ethnic minorities in a way that you don't see very much today. Now, I'm not saying it's a, a perfect world that we live in, mm. in terms of racial harmony. There are still outstanding issues. But I think Britain has come a very long way uh, in the 40 years that I've, I can remember. I mean, in the firestorm after your um, resignation or firing, however mm. we're going to call it, um, you know, all sorts of stuff was being hurled at you. Yeah. Was there any racially motivated stuff I didn't stuff really um, get involved in that. I mean, yeah. I'm not a Twitter warrior. I deliberately avoid getting down those uh, rabbit holes because yeah. you can get into all sorts of fights. You know, some of my colleagues are tweeting all the time. Yeah. And they're in these kind of crazy battles. So I avoided that. Um, and I wasn't really plugged into a lot of that criticism. Did you go into hiding somewhat? No, well, uh, the, the, when you're getting doorstepped, yeah. uh, as I was, yeah. uh, by media, I, I just um, fled. Um, and Where so they, did you they, go? I'm not going to say. <laughs> <laughs> but I... Because I, 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 I knew what would happen. I knew yeah. that they would... And every day... There were people, but after about four or five days, the story moved on. So when I came so back to, to my house, out of the when I came house. back to my house, there was nobody there. It was about six days later. The, right. the truth was, though, Liz Truss made a catastrophic mistake firing you. I mean, you were in it together, That's and you right. had to survive it together. Yeah. And I think I think we've got a, a clip here of her trying to sort of defend that decision. So that, yeah. Let's let's just look at that. See, you know, I'm. I can't, I can't say it was anything but extremely difficult, but he was in Washington at the time at the um, IMF meeting. And you know, I was getting some very serious warnings from senior officials that the, you know, there could be a potential market meltdown the following week if I didn't take action. And I needed to do as much as I could to indicate that things were different. So, I mean, how do you, how do you I get feel, that. But how I do mean, you feel watching that clip? I mean, I was looking at your expression. Um, you look pretty pissed off, I have to well, say. Well, look, you know, the, the, the fact was she had a very successful leadership campaign, which was all about not putting up tax. And I was very clear, and I said it in, repeatedly, that we were going to be joined at the hip, and that was what I was there to do. And so I was in Washington, as, you, as, as uh, she mentioned, and I was summoned back. I should have stayed an extra day. And my thinking was, well, this is just going to add, you know, create more drama. Sh should you have gone at all? Because actually, so it the was truth of, was, there was sort of... They, there was, there was, it was conspiratorial of, activity going on behind your back whilst maybe, you were there. Maybe, but it was one of those things. If I hadn't gone, it would have been a massive deal. It was six of one, half a dozen of the other. You were damned if you did, you were damned if you didn't. If I hadn't gone... It would have been the first time since God knows when that a British Chancellor hadn't gone to the annual meeting yeah. in the IMF, and that would have been the story. So she, um, she's, so, so that that you know, it was it was a difficult call. She said she had no option. I'm quoting here. She had no option but to sack you. Do you agree? Well, of course, I, I don't agree. I mean, I, I think we could have, um, we should have actually worked together. But you know, I'm not. But here you should to... have toughed it out. Do you think? Well, I mean, tough it out. I think I think the one thing that I would say is that in any political, as a general point, in any difficulty, in any, um, you know, uh, a strong, stressful uh, situation where people are buffeting, you know, there are lots of people buffeting around, the one thing you have to do is, that, you know, you've got to 
I think keep a, have a very calm approach. Mm. But leadership. And that was what that was what I wanted to do. Um, and I thought summoning me back a day before the everyone could see. I mean, it was my plane was being tracked, you know, by thousands of people. Um, and and it just shone a huge light on the fact that there was this turmoil. But you know, it's, these are finely judged, so finely balanced questions. And the prime minister, you know, was 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 advised. She took a difficult decision. She said it, it, to me it was a difficult decision. But at that point, when I was sacked, I knew that there wouldn't be much longer of her premiership. And, and actually, I think I was, it was reported uh, Did, in the Sunday Times. Do you think time. that she panicked? Well, look, I mean, I don't want to relive, Would that be fair? relive all Would of that. Would that be fair? But, I, I, I mean, if the, if, the, if the argument was, I'm going to sack my chancellor so that I can prolong my political life, mm. I don't think six days uh, it was a sign of, of massive success in that. Do you feel let down by your officials, uh, possibly by the sacking of Tom Scholar? and indeed let down by the Bank of England, if they'd acted differently on that Monday morning, if they'd started buying some bonds, things could have been very, very different. Well, they'd been committed to that. I think the whole... Um, I think Tom Scholar, I've said, I said it publicly at the time, it's been forgotten, was an excellent uh, civil servant. But he'd been there 30 years. Well, you, but you fired and, him. And we, yeah, I know, you know, but he was, and he got a knighthood, and, they, and the, the, the press said, oh, this is a, a total... Um, you know, it shows that they got it wrong. But he'd had 30 years... Um, and we felt that it was time for him and to move about, on. what about the Bank of England? I think the governor of the bank, I got on quite well uh, with him in the short time I was uh, working with him. People had said that um, they had, you know, interest rates hadn't gone up uh, quickly enough. There was, there was a lot of chatter around that. Um, but I had a good working relationship with the governor. Well, what was quite extraordinary is that having sacked you, uh, Liz Truss then chose Jeremy Hunt mm. As your replacement now, she's not close to Jeremy Hunt. So where did that idea come from? Well, I, I don't know. You'd have to ask the Prime Minister. But I, I think it was—it's quite odd that in her essay she's been uh, talking about the, uh, you know, the fact that the Treasury did this and did that. But she appointed Jeremy Hunt. I mean, that was. Do you, you think know, someone told? Do you think someone no, told her? No, I don't to? think so. I think she she had a. Why good did she do of, it then? Um, because she wanted to stabilise the markets. I think they had. Uh, I think Jeremy did a good job in that. Uh, and it's very much now, you know, let's try and stabilise things and not and not uh, get too excitable, not try and agitate. How would you uh, characterise Hunt's ideology? I think I think it's a very orthodox um, treasury uh, uh, ideology. I mean, so, the, so pretty boring and not going to. No, lead it's not boring. I mean, look, it's not it's not about being boring or being exciting. It's about an approach yeah. to economic management. Yeah, and I well, think what he's doing is is trying to stabilise the market. That's what he's been brought in to do by Liz Truss. Right. And, and, and Liz who appointed taxes. him. It wasn't Rishi. The, the budget's looming now. Um, fortunately for you, you're not in charge. <laughs> um, but clearly something has to be done about the tax burden, doesn't it? It's way too high. Well, look, I mean, that was the whole premise of the leadership contest that we had in the summer, which Liz won. But, of course, you know, what happened in, in October or September happened... And now we've got a new Prime Minister and a new Chancellor. And their job, and I think they're doing a good job at it, actually, is to try and stabilise uh, the markets, which they have done. I think that's been successful. And they've always said that they want to reduce taxes when uh, it's appropriate to do so. <laughs> yeah, the but the question is, when, when is that? We, well, the reality is we've got companies like AstraZeneca, Britain's biggest publicly listed company, announcing this week that they're setting up a new base yeah. in Dublin. Um, you know citing tax reasons, did, by yeah. the way, because corporation tax is so much lower there. Uh, how do you see the implications of that? Look, so I think that we had... Uh, Will I mean, there be more that do that? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I think... I'm, I mean, I've always been very clear about the fact that I don't think high tax... You, you get to prosperity by um, high taxes. I don't think that's the route I to mean, do it. Is, is Some there people a risk do. that a growing number of wealth creators are just going to leave the There's country? always a risk. When you put taxes up, there's always a risk that people who generate wealth... Um, decide to, to up sticks and go somewhere else. And that's what Pascal Sorio, the head of AstraZeneca, who I know, um, and I used to speak to when I was uh, business secretary, um, he, made that, he made that very clear in his statement. And how do you feel about that? I think it's regrettable. I think they're a great company, and I'd, I hope they would come back and, and maybe reconsider their decision. But, All I mean, right, okay, on to well, Brexit, well, come on. Quasi, <laughs> you, you're a Brexiteer. You yeah, saw absolutely. it as a, a great opportunity. Definitely. And... For three years, you were first a Minister of State in the Department right. of Business, and That's then you right. became Secretary yeah. of State. And as a Secretary of State for Business, mm. in a Brexit government, mm. I mean, the whole thing was take control of our money, our laws and our borders. Yeah. You had a great opportunity to start to cut back on the mountain of daft, bureaucratic yeah. EU laws, and you did nothing about no, it. No, we, we started on that. I mean, the, Jacob was brought in, Jacob Rees-Mogg was brought in 
uh, as a minister in the Cabinet Office. We looked at regulation. We've got a bill that's coming through which is going to get rid of a lot of the, the EU regulation. But, but in reality, come on, you no, know no, that bill's not going to go through. No, I think it has a chance. I don't... I has, never has a chance. Let's talk about deferring it. I never prejudge. I never prejudge legislation, but that's clearly the statement of the intent of the government. But the, yes, but the establishment is trying to delay it now by three or four years to 2026. You know, we left in nine, at the end of 19. The end of the transition period was the end of 20. That's right. We Brexiteers, we said to the country, we'd deregulate, we'd go for growth, we'd cut taxes, we'd control our borders. Yeah. You had a major opportunity to cut and we did, regulation, we, and you really didn't well, no, no, start. We did start. I mean, the, the thing I would say about the whole EU debate, a bit of perspective, we were in this thing, we are in the EU for nearly 50 years, certainly before I was born. OK, and I think that a lot of the, it won't take 50 years to get the benefits. It shouldn't do. But having, having been this, we're having, under pressure now. having been in it for 50 years, I think it was a lot to expect that immediately we left. Suddenly everything would be uh, hunky dory. That wasn't realistic. And the other thing that people have forgotten about, and you, you mentioned my whatever departments I was in, I was also in the Brexit department for about nine months. So even more opportunity then, that but, you didn't but, take but, advantage of. Yeah, but at that time, Richard, you'll remember, in 2017, we didn't have a majority. I mean, it was a completely confused situation in terms of where the parliament no, I, was. I, I accept it in 2017. And, and to, between 2017 and 19, so for, for three years, essentially, but between, we were in gridlock, and then Boris actually managed to, to liberate the, uh, the gridlock. Then COVID came three months yeah, later. But, but, but you, and you, we weren't, were, you weren't involved with COVID. You should have been preparing all of this stuff to just slash and burn these daft regulations. And you didn't. We, it we, had, a, we had a legislation. We had we had we have legislation in place. I worked on that. Jacob has worked on that, and it's going through the House of the Parliament. Well, right ra now. rather than raking over what's now ancient history, what about where we are now? Yeah. Do you think? I mean, we've got Jeremy Hunt in the in mm. Number Eleven. Um, he was a Remainer. Mm. Um, Rishi Sunak was a Brexiteer. Yeah, he was. I don't know whether he's a convincing one. Uh, you've heard about the Ditchley Park gathering. Yeah, I don't know about. I mean, I've gathering. been to those gatherings. You sadly weren't invited. I wasn't to that invited, one. funnily enough. Um, um, I mean, do you, is there a danger that there is a move to slide us back into the EU? I think there is a risk of that. Absolutely, I think that. But I mean, you heard I think Michael Heseltine say this earlier um, on your show. He, he just says, "Well, oh, the Brexiteers have messed it up. Then let's go back into the EU." And they, of course, they're not stupid. They're not going to say, "Oh, let's rejoin the EU," but they'll dress it up in some form of, of words. Which essentially means that we'll be in the EU on worse terms. Of your own party. On worse terms. I don't know. I think the party is committed. I know the Prime Minister, uh, Rishi, is committed what about Jeremy to delivering Hunt? Is on he uh, Brexit. Well, the Prime Minister, I mean, he's but, running the government, so he's the one. It, it's one thing having left. Yeah. But you've got to take advantage of I the agree. opportunities. And two years later, after the end of the transition period, yeah. you've got nothing as a government, as a Conservative Party, to show for it. I think we've got quite a lot to show for it, actually. Like I mean, if, you look, if you look at the the big debate, in the, and you'll remember this because we were on the same side, was the amount we were putting into the EU, OK? That was 10 billion... In the, in the old budget uh, framework, it was 10 billion a year. It would have been more in the, 20, in, in the new budget framework. That's, so if you think that's nearly six years of where we would be paying 10 billion a year, that's a lot of money, What okay? about What about that's your lot record of money. on controlling borders? So, on borders, at least we've got an immigration policy <laughs> that we the said... policy earlier. doesn't count for anything. No, no one cares about a policy, quasi. We want no, to control our borders. No, no, policy does matter, because uh, what was happening before is that we were having 150,000 people coming into the country that we had no control over whatsoever. Have you got any now, control over the migrant boats? I think we are trying to get uh, more of a grip on that. But have we you have got a any lot grip more, on it at the moment? But in terms of immigration, Isabel, yeah. we have a lot more say. We've got a lot more uh, control of what our policy so, is than we did when on, we were the, the current Home Secretary admitted that you had lost control of the borders. She's, she's, she admitted that to, I believe, a select committee. I didn't see... Last year, to June 2022, in the year to June, was the highest ever uh, lawful immigration. So, essentially, you've sold to the nation as a government... You've sold a pup. You said Brexit was all about controlling our borders, and we've got record levels of lawful immigration, and we've got record levels of unlawful so immigration. So Brexit, as I remember, was not about banning it all immigration. No, okay? no. But, but it, it wasn't about that. It wasn't about going up to that. record levels up at the top no, of the mountain. No, but, you know, for the need... And, I, and I'm someone who I think we should be able to attract the best talent... Absolutely agree with into that. ..into the country. I don't, I don't see any problem with that. 
And in many instances, people still want to come here, which is a good thing. Is that talent thing. coming over on boats? No, I mean, <laughs> they've got to do it legally, OK? Right. It's got to be legal. It can't be trafficking. It can't be Because I feel like you're that. kind of defending your government's record. And remember, you are a backbencher now, so no, you can, you can speak freely. So, so I, I am, but I'm also a team player. So, how I mean, you, I find it very frustrating. How do you honestly frustrating. feel? How do you honestly feel about the never-ending numbers coming over illegally Look, on boats? How do you really feel It's really frustrating. About it's it? extremely frustrating. Aren't you embarrassed? And also... Well, I'm not embarrassed. Well, you should be. I'm, 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 I'm focused. I'm trying to come up with solutions. And the other thing that I'm, I would stress is that, you know, there are too many people who, are, you know, having been ministers, go on the back benches and then just freely slag off the government and don't give the measure of support. When they were ministers, they expected backbenchers to support them. Well, so they should be supporting as backbenchers the government. Talking of support, obviously, one of the things that you were involved with was, was the price of energy, the cost yeah, yeah. of energy, which was going through the roof. Yeah. And essentially, the cost of energy is... It's the other side of the net zero coin. Yeah. That is the reality. And we've now got a situation where the government's subsidising people's energy bills yeah. and we've got businesses... We talked, touched on AstraZeneca. The other massive problem for businesses is the cost of energy. Yeah. The car industry is collapsing. Ford just yesterday announced 1,300 layoffs as they move towards electrification. Yeah, there JLR. are 3,000 across right. Europe. Yeah, I mean, but, there's a but, context but here. JLR are moving production overseas mainly because of the cost of energy and to do with net zero. The steel industry is begging for hundreds of millions mm. of handouts because of the cost of energy, because of net zero. Many other firms, particularly hospitality, pubs, mm. restaurants, their energy bills are going through the roof. They're shutting when they get off their existing tariffs. This is all because of net zero. It's all, all the, because it's, of net zero. It, the, 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 the cost, the cost of energy right, is directly linked to the move towards renewables. We're subsidising 11 billion to offshore, yeah. re offshore wind farms. There's another 5 billion of uh, balancing costs that people have to pay for. So and, look, and the truth is, net zero is making us poorer, it's making us colder, and you are responsible. No, look, I, I totally disagree with you. The idea that net zero, just burning more coal and, and, and burning fossil fuels is the, is the future, I think, is wrong. It's false. If you look at the costs of energy, what was driving it in the, in the winter of 2021 was the fact that China essentially came out of COVID restrictions and there was huge demand coming out of China for gas and that pushed the price up. And the second double whammy we had was, of course, Putin's invasion but of Kwasi, Ukraine. That had nothing to do. We're sitting on that a century's worth of our own that had cheap to energy do. treasure that oh, you as a government... Thing. Look, look, no, it's look. not just fracking. We've got, we've got onshore gas. We've got onshore oil. Yeah, we do. We've got we're coal. exploiting those. We've got all these things. We're not, we're not exploiting so them. So did you see the profits of Centrica today? Yeah. That's a lot of... That's from, from British that, from that, gas. That's yeah, from the North Sea. But, yeah. but, but that's, what, that's what they do. But the reality is we've, we've, we've got all this shale gas. Yeah. Uh, you know, you and Liz briefly... Uh, wanted to sort of. I was never that. a big fracker no, because I realised but, but that there was it? a big polit funny, political problem. You, there. you say that the cost of energy is nothing you can do about it. In America, the cost of their um, energy, their gas, is a quarter of ours. Why? Because they're fracking. Because so they're look, using so their own I'll, domestic energy. So I'll give you self reliant on it, and and you as a government to bottle it. So look, in Wyoming, there are two people per square kilometre. Okay, in Lancashire, where there was uh, some preliminary fracking right. uh, undertaken, it's about four hundred and fifty people. Okay. So your ability to get through any political pressures by fracking in Wyoming is far greater than is the case wow. in England so, and in Lancashire. So, so, final question, final question. Is there a risk the net zero agenda has gone too far? I think the net zero agenda is absolutely the right agenda. Oh, you're you going do. to say that. You do. do you <laughs> really? I think it's... Yeah, really? Absolutely. You are destroying this no. country's economy. No. You are making people poor. No, 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 no. The idea that you can burn Quasi. coal like we did in the 50s forever and ever Thank you so is much. completely absurd. Thank you Thank so you. much <laughs> for joining us. It's gone way too quick. We'll have to have you back <laughs> on again.